Hello. Welcome to Any Combo Lords joining me here today. I'm here actually with Dandelion. As many of you know, we have a gloriously soft cat around the premises sometimes. And we should take a peek at Dandelion here before he vanishes. What a cute soft fellow. Dandy. Dandelion. All right, he might be done for now. He'll probably return for pets before long. In any case, nice to have you all here. Today, what we wanted to do here in the combo classroom was a little bonus live stream to refresh a few things about a recent episode I made about balanced ternary and the refreshers I want. Oh, Dandelion's back. Okay, he's back. That's so nice. Oh, no, no. He gets spooked easily, but he is such a sweetheart. Dandy. Whoops. Dandelion. So, in any case, today we are going to talk about some other balanced bases apart from balanced ternary. We're also going to play around with this magnetic material called ferrofluid, which I had warming up in the previous stream, but now is fully functioning as not only a lava lamp, but something that we can do strange magnetic shapes with. Now, additionally, I would like to discuss some almost philosophical thoughts about some assumptions people had in my previous episode where I did end up seemingly destroying this computer. Now, for the stream regulars, you may have put together the clues that this was the computer I mentioned that got coffee spilled on it and was already fully non-functional. I'd already gone through a whole ordeal to get my data from a shop, to ask them whether any of the parts were salvageable, which they weren't, to figure out the motherboard was fully broken and decide, okay, I gotta dispose of this laptop. Might as well have some fun with it. But sometimes people comment that they think I'm being wasteful in the combo classroom by using some resource poorly. And I kinda wanna clarify some things about that because while I think criticism is good for an artist's growth and I welcome criticism of any opinion you have that I will take into great consideration because to at its best, a criticism can be a clue about how your product comes across with less bias than you observe it with. When you observe your fully edited episode from my eyes or whatever, it's hard to really see the big scale of the arc of the episode, how the lighting and audio came across, how my delivery came across and such. You have to focus on all these minute details. You get lost and biased. And so if you hear a criticism from someone, it can be a good point to grow from because they may be giving you a clue of a less biased look at your product. However, I don't like when a criticism says something what I consider untrue about me, like that I'm being wasteful when I play around with an already broken computer or other circumstances of little chaos occurring around the classroom. So I wanted to clarify a few things about that before we jump into the math, which will be timestamped afterward. Later today, I'll make sure to add little chapters for whatever stuff we cover today. But I did want to note that out of all the criticisms I get once in a while, I don't mind if people say, well, I especially enjoy if people give me a constructive criticism about something like the delivery or lighting or audio or whatever. And then in the middle category, I don't mind if somebody, and this happens a lot more on the shorts page than on the main page, uh, or more on this channel with the random videos in the shorts algorithm. I don't mind if people call me nerdy or they think that they comment, I need to touch grass, even if the video is taking place in grass, which is a little ironic. I don't mind if they want to say I look homeless, their words, not mine. Stuff like that doesn't really bother me because I find it silly if they want to, you know, have a problem with that, feel free. But if somebody says I'm wasting resources, it kind of bothers me, which I get that comment once in a while. 
because I really try not to be wasteful. Waste is a problem in the world, and inherently as a human, you're going to cause some waste. And you're going to have to waste to consume and survive and to help others to some degree. And you may pick a few aspects of your life in which you waste a little more than is necessary for survival. A lot of people that could be buying new clothes when your old clothes aren't worn out. That could be getting new technology when you already have a somewhat similar technology that does the same thing. It could be buying meals out and not finishing the leftovers. Uh, getting a ride somewhere that you could have walked to. Any of those things are little choices we make in our day-to-day -day life about, you know, consuming a product in a way that wasn't obligated for survival. And that's especially going to be true in entertainment. If you like watching Netflix or Hollywood or whatever, it costs a lot of resources to create that Netflix show you're watching. You know, they don't, they're not as honest about it with you as I am, but they're burning a lot more resources than me. And so there is, you know, things consumed for entertainment or things that get used in a way that wasn't necessary for human survival. But I think that out of the best of that would be not only to entertain, but to try and teach. And once in a while, I give myself the leeway that okay, I'm going to prop a $5 old broken prop in a way that it might break and reduce its $5 value to $2 or whatever. But everything around here is obviously really cheap. I get this stuff free and used. Uh, the stuff like this got mailed to me by cool fans at the mailbox address that I, a private mailbox, I have the address in the description. And in general, you won't see me break something like this or the thing I'm filming on or whatever. You might see me break an old $5 clock or a laptop that's actually already broken. Now, a lot of people seemed to think it was a functional laptop when they saw my last episode and saw me destroy this. But no, as my stream people knew, it was fully non-functional. And I think it's kind of funny for someone to assume that I was destroying a functional computer for a number of reasons. Like, do I look like I can afford to spend a thousand dollars on a prop to destroy? I l basically live in my parents' backyard in a tiny room in their house. I can't even afford rent or like to eat out often. I'm not smashing new computers. And I also think it's funny because if you were to smash a functional computer, wouldn't you have wanted to show the screen working? I never showed the screen working or had it lit up or said anything about it working. So I think a critical thinker would assume, okay, there's a non ever working computer that gets hit by a Rube Goldberg-esque trap to get fall into a very conveniently placed bucket of water. You'd assume the computer is probably not working. But some people think I'm being wasteful and stuff. They don't even read the description. I did clarify in this episode, no functional technology was harmed. And I clarified in the last episode, for example, that when I had a billion bananas on set, I ate as many of those as weren't fully smashed. One or two of them got smashed, but I ate pretty much all the bananas. So. You know, we don't condone waste in, co waste in combo class. However, we do condone the ability to own things that really don't have much value unless you spent more time fixing them and relocating them than you would take to just create a new version of them. And we like to have a little chaos with those things. But let's remember, we don't want to be wasteful. And if you ever see me destroy something that I never told you it was functional, probably assume it was already broken, because we have a lot of broken stuff around here. Last little bit about that is don't be too addicted to technology. I think some people who even knew that it was a non-functional computer felt hurt by seeing a computer smashed. Oh, it hurts me to see this thing hit, like as if they were seeing an animal getting hurt in a video or something. So come on, don't be that attached to technology. We're gonna, we'll have fun with it here today. We can smash these to whatever degree we want in the stream. I tried to open it, but it requires these tiny little screws that I didn't have. 
So I don't know if I can actually unscrew it, but yeah, I will admit that although I had the balanced ternary episode planned for a while, I've had many episodes planned. There are many that are ready to film. And the reason I did that one last week was a mix of me having it fully brainstormed and me happening to have a computer prop to destroy that fit the arc of the episode. So, let's see if we got any comments before we jump into any of our mathematical topics like balanced bases. Uh, I'm going to talk about number randomization. We're going to talk about a few fun things. Now, for anyone who hasn't seen that balanced ternary episode, it is linked in the description, as well as a few combo class shorts you may not have seen. I've been starting to put out some more shorts again, but not notify people every time because my main passion is the long videos, and I do relate to people who want the long videos to be the majority of their feed. And so, if you want to stay up to date with all the shorts, I often am posting them in the Discord too, but I will, during streams like this, link them all in the description as well. Now, let's see. Somebody's saying a ferrofluid lava lamp getting psychedelic very fast. And it does look quite psychedelic and cool. This thing has gotten more warmed up. It was actually sent to me by George Carosi here. A uh, cool Patreon and uh, gift giver of things that make our combo class set look extra cool. And this one is probably tied for my favorite of the things I've received that way. W probably tied with the uh, Toro Flux, which I know this thing's simple, but I love this thing. Uh, this thing's really cool to me. The simplicity is what makes it. But probably tied in coolness with the Toro Flux is a slightly less simple, slightly cooler looking thing here, which resembles a lava lamp as we've seen, but you can make do much cooler things than a lava lamp. You can spike up blobs. Let's try and get a close up on this spikiness. So can you see how it's sort of spiky around the edges? and it sucks other things into it. Now, if I put it kind of sideways, you can see it's even 3D spiky. It has spikes coming out of it in a 3D way. Ooh, and it absorbs other bits. Now, although it's spiky with the magnet, afterward it starts forming spherical-like shapes. Uh, it takes a little while to get close to a sphere, but it starts forming spherical shapes relatively quick as soon as you remove the magnet from it. Now, this is really cool because it will blob up on its own even if we're not doing anything, but if we ever put the magnet close to it, it'll make it get extra spiky and chaotic. So, if anyone has any ferrofluid experiments they'd like to see, let me know and I will do them to it. We can also just sort of ripple up a bunch of wildness into there and get all these little tiny bubbles for a bit. Now, thank you to everyone who's joining me and commenting and saying that I'm cool or they appreciate my explanation style or whatever. I appreciate it. That's really nice. Now, what we are, someone asked about the number bleem. I don't know about the number bleem, but I usually assume that numbers like jillion and kajillion, and I'm assuming bleem is in that category are variable numbers and are actually, I don't know, maybe bleem means something else, but numbers that have a nickname that aren't assigned to a mathematical thing, but are a more casual nickname, I like to think of as a variable. You know, if I had, I have like a jillion dice on the table right now, but that means like I have 50 or so dice on the table. If I said I had a jillion grains of sand, that would be more than 50 grains of sand. Now, someone's mentioning a drum and bass sort of thing, a speaker filmed with uh, ferrofluid. Now, it actually is used in certain sorts of speakers. I remember reading about that when I looked it up. It actually apparently was invented or 
some forms of it invented at least for NASA to help out with certain space related things. Because as you can imagine, this could have useful properties. You know, it's not necessarily just cool looking. It could also help you in some weird way. Now, I still have to research ferrofluid a little more, but I do think it, you know, has a lot of functionality, at least potentially. And for now, until we know what functionality to get out of it, we're sort of just embracing the cool look of it. Now, speaking of drum and bass and speakers, uh, one recent request of some viewers when I asked what they wanted to see in a bonus live stream was another, which I've only done once, beat making live stream where I show how to mathematically make a beat. Now, when I say mathematically, it's more so just me making music a way that I enjoy and spend some of my time doing. But when I thought about it, it has a far more mathematical structure and methodology than the average person would make music. Now we're over the course of grade negative two and onward going to do some more music theory and I also will occasionally be releasing some of my own music. Now, if anyone ever gets annoyed or whatever, because one sixth of the content on this channel ever becomes something like music or things like that, other experiments, make sure you're at least tuned to the combo class channel. This is my experiments channel almost. This is my little personal playground, but you know, I'm going to try all sorts of stuff on this channel over time. It's worked out so far. And the Combo Class channel will continue to be the one where my slightly more fully thought through perfectionist works go. Such as another one that I don't know if I'll have one out this weekend on the Combo Class channel, but I will have it out either Sunday or Monday. Now, George is recommending holding the disc magnet perpendicular to the glass. So maybe you mean with the tip or something. And when I do with the tip, it's more blobby. Whereas when I do with the side, it's more spiky. That's interesting. So I don't know if you can see that much, but here it's more like little blobs. And here it's like a bunch of spikes. And whoa, it absorbed some. Now, and George also mentioned it looks sort of like a cross section of if you add about half of a spiky sphere. Now, spiky shapes like that are interesting. The spikier you made a shape like that, it wouldn't necessarily gain volume at an infinite rate or whatever. Like you could have some way of iterating spikes on spikes that still ended up being a finite amount of vo volume, almost like an infinite series converging to a value. But the surface area will keep growing as I add spikiness. So the spikier I make a shape, the more the surface area to volume ratio can grow, which is sort of the opposite of the sphere form it takes there, where a sphere is the highest volume to surface area ratio, the other way around. So that's interesting. It's getting both sides of the spectrum. Now, we're gonna set this to the side and try and keep it in the shot because it looks pretty neat. But a few mathematical topics I wanted to jump into included a quick explanation of another balanced base, which for those who haven't seen my balanced ternary episode, this will spoil a little of it, but not a crazy amount. So don't worry if you haven't seen it, I'll try and make this make sense regardless. And in that episode, we looked at how there are computers that have used this stranger base than binary that is in a way more elegant and symmetrical where you use three symbols, but they're balanced. So the zero is in the middle. What would that mean? That would mean we have zero, one and negative one. So that was balanced ternary, which really is a nickname for balanced base three. The same way that binary is a nickname for base two. So if we can make balanced base three, can we make others? Well, as usual, there's any amount of potential. You can make all sorts of bases. 
The type I mentioned and hinted very briefly in the episode is that we could have done it with other odd numbers. The reason I mentioned odd numbers greater than one as what we're going to use as what was our old base and turn it into balanced is because then it will be the exact same properties that a lot of the properties that balance ternary or the third balance base, the simplest, because balanced base one is not going to work. You can think through on your own, you know, it, it would mean we just have zeros. So balance base three or ternary is the simplest, but we can go onward. And there are ways of making an even number into one, like other extensions to bases. But the reason I said odd numbers greater than one is because we can make one that's like almost identical to balance ternary's properties and still have a lot of the cool abilities. Now, it's less likely a computer would use something like balanced base five because, you know, computers like circuits to work a certain way and two works well as an off on sort of state and three can kind of work as like a on or two directional on or off, like left, right, neutral in a way. Five and onward, less likely for a computer to use, but mathematically they work pretty well. So what would balanced base five be? Well, normally in base five, you have a zero, which we're still going to have. You have a one and a two, which we're still going to have. And then you'd have a three and a four. Now the three and the four now are going to be shifted around the other way on the clock. By the clock, I mean mod five, which actually is going to describe either normal base five or balanced base five. In fact, let's put them on here to compare. So here's what you could call the unbalanced base five, which is sort of funny because normally you would just call it base five. But when we are in this realm, we have to clarify it is unbalanced base five. Now in base five, we have zero, one, two, and we could call these values congruent to three or to negative one. It's equivalent in, oh no, three is negative two. Equivalent to negative two in mod five. Same with four is equivalent to negative one in mod five. And so, Sometimes we will describe the mods in the negative way where we're like, I'm talking about the values congruent to negative two in mod five, which really, you know, will usually simplify to the values congruent to three, but they are the negative twos also. They're two before the start. So knowing that we can see it represents the normal base five, zero, one, two, three, four, zero, and it represents the balanced one where we go like negative two, negative one, zero, one, two. Now, the reason why I said we would want to balance an odd base is because we would want to, if we add three, also add negative three. And with this type of base, unless we change a bunch of the rules, we want a zero in the mix. And so we're going to end up with an odd number total, which is sort of funny because normally we have more often looked at even numbered bases because if a number is really divisible, which helps for a base, a divisible number is likely to be even. And so we've looked at like six and 12 or highly divisible numbers, for example, and even two in comparison to that size range is like the most divisible winner for that low size. We now sort of have an ability on the odd basis that's fun, where if I add three and negative three, this is balanced base seven. Now, how would I write something like this? Let's figure it out. Let's see how balanced base seven would write the number 20, which was an example we used in the other episode. How would they write 20 of a thing? Well, we would need, since the spots are actually still powers of seven, just our abilities to use are per spot, use none of them, use plus or minus one, two, or three of them. So these would be a single symbol. 
we're going to just have them be in a little circle, negative one, negative two, negative three in a circle, but they would have their own digit symbol. So this spot is the seven to the zeroth, which is one. So we have a one's place still. Seven to the first power's place, a seven's place. Seven to the second place, a 49's place. Now, the 49 is too big for the number 20 I asked about, so we're gonna need to start with the sevens, unless the sevens can't get there, because this balanced base sometimes needs to use too much of one and subtract some of the next. But let's see if our sevens can get there. We're allowed to use three of them, and that gets us pretty close to that 20 we want. That gets us 21, and the reason I know I can do that is because I can put the negative one digit symbol there, and that would be how they write 20. So, balanced bases are sort of neat. Some of the traits that balanced ternary had that these will have also are the property where if you have a decimal, like I have like this number in balanced base three, some repeating or non-repeating whatever decimal, and I truncate it at some point, like lose some of it or only give the computer some of it, then it's the same as rounding to that spot, which is not always the same in the unbalanced bases. Like base 10, you only round to the losing all that spot if you're lower than halfway. And so truncation is the same as rounding in a balanced base of this sort. And the negatives we can express without a minus sign because these would just have digit symbols. And the negatives look pretty symmetrical. Like to make 20, I did three of those and negative one of those. And to make negative 20, I would have used negative three of those and one of those. I would flip the sign of all the non-zero aspects. So those are a few cool abilities of the balance bases. I actually like balance ternary the most. It's nice and simple and elegant, but balance base five and seven and onward are pretty cool too. Theoretically, we could even try and balance complex bases or other sorts of bases that we've messed with. So this could be a topic that will return in the future. And hopefully to anyone who caught these, it will now be in your combo class vocabulary that occasionally, although normally if we say base three, you assume we're using zeros, ones, and twos. If once in a while we say a balanced base is coming out, could be useful, might come up once in a while. So that's just like a little refresher on some balanced bases. For those who haven't seen the one that explains balanced ternary more thoroughly, that is linked in the description. It's the new one. Same one I mentioned that people get really mad if I like uh, drop the laptop or it like uh, hurts their soul. So I don't know. I'm going to throw something in the trash and it looks like a good prop to be you know, catch some attention with, I'll do that first. Part of why I make things easier to get bumped over and sometimes in setups where I'm not shocked that some chaos occurs is to catch people's attention and trick them into learning the math. And it's working so far. There's a lot of combo lords who don't necessarily like watch math videos, who saw a few crazy clocks fall or whatever, and it attracted their attention for long enough for them to, I don't know, hear something cool about primes or whatever and stick around. The other reason is because it's very fun and it's like tied for my favorite part of the filming. They're like, of the, okay, cool, I get to present the math stuff. And uh, okay, a lot of stuff fell over in this shot. Let's see how it looked. <laughs> okay. So, in any case, we're going to have another fun Combo Class episode coming out either this weekend or early next week, which will be, I think, the one I might do now, although I'm starting to film a few at a time uh, to have good footage building for them. And I even filmed a clip of this, so you can try and guess what topic I would have used a little tiny clip of this in the episode for. But that's probably not this week's. This week's, I'm probably going to finish one that is something I've kind of covered in streams before, but I think would be a good episode to clarify in general, which is going to be a 
surprisingly easy set of tools that let you memorize every prime number up to a certain point. Now by memorize, we're not gonna memorize a list the way you'd memorize the digits of pi or something. We're going to have a few tools that will let us within a few seconds know if any number up to a given size is prime. And if it's the range that'll take just a few seconds and is surprisingly easy is all of the primes, I'm going with two digit for the you know, hook of the episode, but really the technique I'll show gets us a little further than two digit, gets us a little into the three digits. But if you've ever wanted to easily know which two digit numbers are or aren't prime, I realize it's easier than you may assume. And so we'll do a little episode about that. And it's also going to refresh some clear details about if a number isn't prime, if a number is composite, what are necessary structures that sometimes must be going on inside any composite number? Because to see if a given number is prime, we're not going to look at it and say, I know it only has two factors from some magical primeness trait. We're going to go through a quick list of composite checks. And if it passes this short list of composite checks, then or passes or fails, depending how you calibrate your thing, just depending which way you describe it from. If it gives the right result on that, we'll know instantly if it's prime or not. By instantly, I mean it might take three seconds or something. But I think that'll be a fun way to structure an episode about, you know, there's more stuff I want to say about primes and their relation to other things, like square numbers are going to come up in it. Three vins are going to come up in it. And I thought a good structure for that or a good hook for that episode will be how to easily know every two digit prime. You know, it's kind of weird random skill, but why not? I feel like the type of people who watch my videos are the type of people who wouldn't mind easily knowing a way of knowing if a two digit number is prime or not. Spoiler alert. Not, I mean, it's not actually a spoiler, like mental challenge possibility alert. It can actually get us up to 120 with the same amount of technique that gets us to 100. Basically, the same amount of technique. So maybe think through some ways I'm going to speed up the process. I mean, some things you can obviously predict. Like we'll probably mention something about how prime numbers can't end in an even digit unless they're the number two or stuff like that. But... There's a lot of shortcuts that make it shockingly easy. It's actually something that's kind of neat about in the episode, we'll look at a given number. And if we prove certain things about it, we won't only know about it, but we'll know about every number smaller than it, which is basically setting a range that we know all the primes within. Because of course there's a limit. If you ask me a pretty big three digit number and ask me if it's prime, it might take me a few minutes. You know, there's, we have to add steps to our technique to accommodate larger numbers. All right. Now somebody's commenting about some strange infinite sums. Now, when I mentioned an infinite sum, I meant a more typical type of summation where if you had an infinite amount of terms of something, it can either be said to converge toward a finite value that it gets closer and closer to. And the way we can define converge in a slightly clearer sense is no matter how small of a fractional number you pick, this number will at some point be closer than that to the end. And it will get closer over the time. And so Convergent series are one thing. Divergent series typically diverge toward infinity. I mean, not typically in terms of like the average series. What is that? What does random or average series even mean? But <laughs> check this out, by the way. That's what I was going to talk about random numbers. It's a bingo thing. <laughs> so anyway, to know a divergent series, we often look at the ones that are divergent toward infinity, which means they grow without bound. Sort of the opposite of it will, no matter how small of a fraction you pick, it'll get within that of a given number. In this case, no matter how big of a number you pick, it will get bigger than that at some point. And 
There's also divergent series that fluctuate in a weird way. So one minus one plus one minus one plus one infinitely is also a divergent series, because if you take its partial sums, it's bouncing and it's going one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, and it's not getting closer and closer to a single value. So that is divergent, although it doesn't diverge toward infinity. So you can do other methods of summation when you're like, oh, well, it, so okay, so it goes divergent. What if we want to investigate it and get more data? Let's make up new types of summation that give us interesting facts about it, that assign a value to it. And so sometimes the value of 0 0.5 is assigned to that series in a you know pretty logical sense of if you took the averages you can at any given point you can feel it doing that the average of the partial sums does converge to something which is 0 0.5 but then there's the whole deal that okay i love the channel number file i want to present on there someday uh and they're a magnificent channel but one of their videos was not great for pop culture math because it got everyone talking about 1 plus 2 plus 3 supposedly equals negative 1 12th. They start citing the fact that the great mathematician Ramanujan had it in his notebooks. But he didn't mean it adds to that. He knew that 1 plus 2 plus 3 diverges toward infinity. He was finding other metrics that you can assign a new version of summation in quotes, a something type of summation, that is not normal adding of the numbers so that you can get some data out of it and not just hit a brick wall with its divergence. So you can assign a value of negative 1 12th to that using a certain summation technique, but it doesn't equal it. So it's, it goes toward infinity. The reason I don't like that is because it makes some people like not trust math almost. They're like, well, my instinct tells me that it should go toward infinity, but I'm not going to try and resolve the instinct with the paradox. I'm just going to know that it's this weird other thing that math throws the negative one twelfth at you. But it is actually a case where your instincts correct. That series gets bigger and bigger and it diverges toward infinity. And so the negative one twelfth little over dramatized, you know, it's, it's cool, but it's not the sum of the series. So, Somebody says, is 97 divisible by 7? You can double 7. I think they're doing the same thing as me, where you double 7, the last digit, and take the difference. And the difference between double of the last digit and the rest of the number is not a multiple of 7, so it's not divisible. And yes, that can be useful. And... That may even be mentioned again in the episode I'm discussing about primes. But like I said in another episode that did well on here, seven is the weirdest. That is the weirdest trick for a one digit numbers divisibility to have to do doubling the last digit, subtracting it from the rest of the number. It gets kind of bad when you have a big number. Because if you have like a number with like five digits, you double the last digit and then you have to subtract it from that four digit number. So, and then you have to figure out if that's a multiple of seven. So you sometimes have to iterate it. <laughs> so it's way worse of it, even though it is a trick that I've mentioned, so much worse than the tricks that like two and five have with the last digit, or even the tricks that three and nine have where you add digits. So, Thank you all for the comments. And what we're going to look at next is a little question that somebody asked last time that I never got around to answering because you know me on the live stream, nobody edits this and I get distracted. So I ended up getting distracted by the Riemann hypothesis, a really cool open question in math. Because somebody asked, when I mentioned that it was worth a million dollars, if you prove the Riemann hypothesis, and that it's not the only problem like that, somebody asked, 
why are some math problems worth a million dollars? And I noted that it was an interesting question and then got distracted by the Riemann hypothesis, <laughs> which I actually have part of drawn over there. If you look over there, that is part of the Riemann hypothesis is visualization. Now, I do want to answer that question. I think it's an interesting question. Why are some math problems worth a million dollars? Now, it's funny because to any mathematician who solves one of the problems we're going to look at, the million dollar ones in particular, the mathematician is not going to be motivated by the money. If somebody is trying to hustle money, they're going to give up after the fourth year of going deeper and deeper into that singular proof that, that absorbs their life. The mathematician that solves these things is going to be obsessed with the problem. And so the, they're going to want to love that problem and want to get it solved for math and want to dedicate essentially as much of their life. They don't know how much of their life to the problem until they might get it. And the type of people who solve it are not going to be the people who did it for the money. <laughs> Hopefully they get the money and can use it well. Although the only case of the million dollar problems getting solved so far, one of them was solved and the award money was not accepted. The guy got into some disagreement with the committee, didn't like, he kind of reminds me of, uh, I mean, I would have found a way to get the money because it would have been really useful probably, but maybe this guy already had enough money or something. And he didn't like the overly academic nature and the way they were crediting things. And he was just like, okay, I'm sick of this. I'm not going to go through all these formalities you're trying to set up that I disagree with. You keep your money. And they found some other like good cause to put it to because he didn't go to the ceremony where they would have given him the money. And so when they have now asked that guy, Grigory Perelman, to try and like see what he's up to, he just vanished. He just solved one of the biggest problems in math history and then vanished into the woods and want to, let's see, they have a funny uh, description of on Wikipedia of like the last time somebody got in contact with this fella. So let me pull that up. Grigory Perelman, brilliant mathematician, solved this thing called the Poincaré conjecture. I might be mispronouncing some of these millennium problems, you know, but so, I think it's the Poincaré conjecture. And looking at this guy's bio, um, if you see what he's up to now, after he solved one of the biggest problems in math and didn't take the million, refused to accept the million dollar prize. He stated, the main reason is my disagreement with the organized mathematical community. I don't like their decisions. I consider them unjust. I totally understand the guy. I relate. Then it says he vanished and they don't even know if he's still working on math or if he's just like hanging out somewhere because the last time they tried to get in touch with him, um, where is this? It's probably up in this section. Let me see. Now, okay, I don't see it here. There's maybe somewhere in this article. I saw this analogy or an anecdote that apparently one of the last times, maybe the last time anyone's heard from him is a journalist tried to reach out to him where he was living somewhere in a like foresty area. And he was like, leave me alone. I'm busy picking mushrooms. And so nobody knows if this guy's still working on math and like about to solve another great problem or if he's just like hanging out with his family or something. I don't know. But what I wanted to look at is First of all, that's an example to me of the type of person who solves one of these things really cares about the problem more than they care about the money. But why do they make uh, problems worth a million dollars? 
Now, it's not even just these. There are seven of them made by this thing called the Clay Institute that have a million dollar prize. But there's even at least an eighth one, this thing called the Beale Conjecture. The value of the prize has increased several times and is currently one million. So there's at, at least eight things, one of which is solved. So still seven, if you count the Beale one, worth millions. Here's an interesting question for a viewer to put together if anyone wants to let me know in a comment later or whatever. Uh, can you add up some lower bound on how much money is currently available for math prizes? Because there's seven million here with the remaining six millennium problems in the Beale conjecture. And there's a bunch of other smaller problems with bounties that I want someone to add them up. I'm curious. You know, is it just going to be eight million in some change or does all the other little prizes add up another million or what? Now, one of the forerunners of there are two people I would like to mention who are great mathematicians who I'm sure were inspirations to the people who made the Millennium Prize problems. The first is Paul Erdős, a mathematician who loved open problems and who put ma money prizes. He wasn't rich or anything. He had a crazy life. And he would just offer like little cash prizes, like $100 or whatever, for a particular problem that he was interested in seeing solved. And it helped motivate some to get solved. Now, a small enough problem, maybe somebody could solve it just to hustle for the money. You know, you're not going to solve the Riemann hypothesis to hustle for the million dollars. Bad, bad use of time if you don't care about the math. But one of these mil little problems, maybe people were just inspired to like, hustle to solve them to get the money from him. So one reason why you might put money on a thing is just you are curious to see it solved and money is a motivational factor. It helps people. Some people in a disproportionate way of how they analyze it, where they're like, money, money, I need that. Other people where it genuinely is like, will change their life. You know, my life would be incredibly different if I had a lot of money. And my life would also be incredibly different if I like had zero or negative money and wasn't able to eat food. You know, like I am able to eat food and have shelter and stuff. So my life would be way different if I didn't have that amount of money. My life would also be way different if I had enough money to like actually eat out or not worry about every single purchase I make and stuff. But, and if anyone wants to help me get cool science toys, there is a Patreon. But anyway, the one reason you might do it is because People will work for money and you want the problem to be solved. But another reason you might do it, I think, is just to popularize it. The fact that it has a million dollars on it makes it get talked about. So the Riemann hypothesis already gets a good amount of talk, but even more because it's worth a million dollars. And some of these other ones, I bet you like Birch Swinnerton Dyer conjecture would not get as many uh, would not be as well known if it hadn't had a million dollar bounty. Hodge conjecture would not be as well known. Navier Stokes, pretty popular in physics anyway. This one's pretty popular in computer theory, but they're all more popular because of that million dollar bounty. It gets them talked about. And so it puts the idea in the media that there are still really important big math things to solve, that they weren't all solved back in the day by Euclid and Euler and Gauss. You know, many things were, but there are still things that we are working toward and that we are getting over the years. Like the Poincaré conjecture of these was solved not long after they started the problem. So that'd be about 2002 or so, I want to say. It was solved in 2006. So, or no, yeah, yeah some of the papers were in 2002 and three. And then it was published fully in 2006, I guess. So, so that was relatively new. Fermat's last theorem was solved in 1993 and stuff. So I think it's good for people in the media to know there's something big going on that's still not solved. Now, these are very hard to explain problems. And due to my curiosity about them a while ago, I bought a whole book about them. There have been entire books written about these problems. This book some, by some guy, Keith Devlin, called The Millennium Problems. Um, I'm going to be honest. I give it a, a B grade. It was definitely worth reading, but it, it wasn't the deepest explanation of all these topics. I still don't 
fully understand all of them and not that I necessarily would have just by reading one book about them because they're very deep questions. But I felt like it was a little too casual at times with the author being like, and this thing is very confusing and I don't know about it. And it's like, all right, well, why don't you wait another year before writing the book or like pull in another mathematician who knows about it to quote or something. But sorry to diss the guy who was well written too. It's a good book. B grade is, you know, not a bad rating. So I did enjoy reading it. And it goes into ways of visualizing all these problems. And they're about different things. Like the Poincaré conjecture is about these sphere-like shapes in other dimensions and what traits of smoothness they have to oversimplify it. And you have the Riemann hypothesis that I know the most about is a number theory question that relates to prime numbers and infinite sums. The Navier-Stokes is physics-like. It's about like fluid flow. And P versus NP is about which things are kind of what things are provable or solvable in a given time with a given algorithm. And this one's another physics-y one I don't know quite as much about. So they're kind of, some of them are a little physics-y. They're not even pure math, all of them. But something like the Riemann hypothesis is pure math. This is, you know, you're not going to quote gravity in your proof of this or anything. So these are cool. The one that I do know enough about is the Riemann hypothesis. Like I've mentioned, we will do an episode about that, but first we're going to do a more general episode at some point about infinite sums. I've done a bonus video about that and some shorts, but I want to show some of my favorites. There are some infinite sums that either diverge to infinity when you wouldn't expect them to, or you would expect to diverge to infinity, but they converge to a finite value ones that converge to a particularly cool constant. So we're going to go through just some of my favorite infinite series in some episode. Then that's, after that, we will call back on how two of them, which are going to be what's called the harmonic series, and one referred to as the Basel problem, which is the reciprocals of the squares added up. Those two that will be in the reciprocals episode will be like, hmm, those are actually slices of this... Riemann zeta function. So, and someone says Perelman lives in Moscow, not in some forest. So, maybe I just imagined him in the foresty area from the mushroom anecdote, which I did read somewhere. I'm not sure, you know, if they have it on that article on the Wikipedia or not. But maybe he just likes to go in the woods to pick mushrooms. He could live in a city. I don't know. Part of the point is the mystery. The forest represents the mystery in a way. If I ever vanish for some years, you can maybe assume I'm in the forest. And if I'm not really, then maybe the forest represented the unknown. All right. So thank you for different comments. Like somebody commented, one of the reasons he denied the prize is he thought that the com uh, the corporations or organizations were not properly crediting one of his co-authors or somebody who had helped set up some of the foundations that he built off. And thank you to all of the cool comments. Now, somebody asked, would there ever be a mode in a sample of numbers with an infinite amount of values? Now, mode is the value that occurs most frequently. And if you have an infinite amount of values, theoretically you could have, say, a multi-set where you have some reason where in your multi-set you have some of the smaller numbers twice or multiple times and some of the later numbers a single time, then your mode could be one of the smaller numbers. You could make a circumstance where that worked. It does remind me of random numbers I was kind of thinking of talking about because I got this new bingo thing that is like dice, random-ish. We will look at random versus pseudo-random behavior at some point. And a big question is, to what degree can you actually make something random? Because if I roll a die, there is some spin and some physics involved that makes it pretty hard to get random. 
And I wonder how they test the dice, because if you make a die, and you note that the punching of six holes makes this side have more holes in it than the one, and you wonder, is that going to make this side hit? Maybe more, maybe less, maybe some difference than that with one hole. How do they test it? Do they just have, because if you have one machine rolling it, it's just based on like how the machine's calibrated to flip it. Do you have like humans in a room? That would be a pretty funny job. Maybe if I ever manufacture my own dice as some merchandise to make some better dice, I'll have to hire some people to like roll them a thousand times and then <laughs> see like how fair they are. <laughs> and dice are not fully random. Bingo obviously is not fully random. But what is? You know, when I was a kid one day and I, this sort of a trope of the idea of a random number generator that people assume is something you can just have. But really, it's kind of hard to make something approach what you could call a type of randomness. Because, well, you know, what do you tell your random number generator to do? Like, actually think about it. How do you tell, what program are you telling the generator? It can involve things like maybe you take some crazy big number and you put it in some mod and see the value after that. And you try and do some equation where when we iterate that, it gives a scattered range of values. So there are ways to make things random-esque, but it requires a lot of work. And some random number generators zoom in on natural phenomena, such as audio waves. If you zoom in on an audio wave, it has all these little spikes that are in a way, by certain ways of turning them into numbers, more random than me trying to roll this dice perfectly. Now, with the bingo randomness, I don't even think we have all the numbers on the balls. I'm not sure. So it might even be like a random number from 1 to 70, except it's not between 30 and 40 or something. I don't know. Hopefully it has them all. We'll see. Now, the other Millennium problems are pretty neat too. So as I study them more over time and build on what I learned from this book, sorry if it sounded like I dissed it. I love reading, you know? Like I said, criticism should be taken good if it's, you know, criticism about an opinion about the art and not a uh, assumption about how something worked in the art. Now, reading is good, remember, I love a hobby of mine is whenever I buy new props for the classroom, like whenever I buy new whiteboard markers or whatever, I also look for a few used math books. And there are so many cool sounding math books in the world, some of which will be written by me in the future. And out of all the cool math books in the world, I often just get which ones are used for cheap because, you know, I can find one that's going to be a good book that's used for cheap. And so... I get a lot of like five or ten dollar books and still have to get through a big part of the stack of them. But you do learn a lot from that. And reading a paper book can put you in a sort of meditative zone sometimes that may make you learn differently, which can, you know, add up to learning more if you're learning different at different ways than reading through a computer. So I would recommend doing some of each. All right. Now, that was a good amount of the mathematical related topics I wanted to cover. Let me see. What else did I have that I wanted to bring up today? Random numbers. Ferrofluid. We also have a large beaker in case this comes in handy. So we have a three liter beaker. You know, never know when we'll need to use this for something or another. But in general, I think that was most of the topics I wanted to cover today. And um, by the, the way, just to add one more detail, someone from the comments is noting about the Millennium Prize that got rejected by the guy Perelman, that they have a quote here that says he rejected the prize because they say it's almost a direct quote. So I don't know. I would look it up. But that they didn't want to put 
the other guy, Hamilton, as a co-author. That, that may have been the reason why he didn't take the prize in that moment, but I know in general why he retracted from the big, I work at a college and wear a suit and teach math. I'm all organized mathy. He retracted from that world for a variety of disagreements, not and disagreements with the structure of it, which probably reached a boiling point when they didn't properly credit the guy, other guy. Now, somebody is saying they take the time and then square it a bunch of times is one way to do it. That sounds interesting. And somebody says it can be based on temperature. That sounds like a good version of the natural spiky graph I was mentioning. Although temperature is a slightly more wavy graph than a sound wave. But I don't know when you zoom in. So there are um, different functions, but it's still something mathematicians are working on. And if you look up many of the devices you'd call random, a lot of them are technically described as pseudo random, that they're trying to approximate a certain statistical randomness. Uh, someone's recommending a book, book called Shortcut Math, which uh, I think I have. I might have that in my room. I think I might have, not to be mean to the book again, you know, we do a little playful roasting here and constructive criticism. I think I might have had a book that was just doing like a lot of like starting out with kind of neat arithmetic tricks of like how to turn something into a decimal or whatever, or how to divide by something. But they got like really random. They were like, okay, here is how to take 12.5% of a three digit number easily. It's like, okay, yeah, that's kind of cool that you have this whole formula to take 12.5%, which if you turn into the form of one eighth, the uh, formula is pretty obvious sometimes from it being the transition. So maybe I'm thinking of a different book. Sorry if I'm accidentally catching this other guy in the crossfire. But I'll bring that book out one time. I had one that I thought was kind of silly of shortcut math because it just went off like, here's how to calculate 71.917% of a number starting in six. Stuff like that. That is a slight exaggeration. I'll bring that back out. We will take another check on that one. But the, the shortcut math I had, which may not have been that one, I maybe would have given more of a C grade compared to this one I gave a B grade. Now, I have recommended some of the books I consider A grade in the past, and I guess we got our chat hanging out on the side here with a delay. You folks can see how the delay works, I guess. But in any case, there's um, a lot of good books I will recommend again in the future. I don't have them right here. They're in my room, but I have recommended a few good ones. I do like writing myself too. And as usual, I've been working on some dense projects, both fiction and nonfiction. And I do hope that it won't be too long from now, hopefully grade negative two or three, that I start releasing some of my written works as well. Now, as I release written works and music and other things like that, don't worry, I'm still gonna make a lot of videos. I just have a lot to share with the world. So there will be written texts as well. There'll be musical things as well, other sorts of thing. But it won't get in the way from us having pretty much every week a combo class episode, a bonus video, a live stream or two, and that sort of goodness as well. So somebody says it might be that book, but it's incredibly useful. I might have been, you know, overly critical of certain parts of the book. I'm sure if you didn't know many shortcuts of the simpler tricks it shows, they would be very useful to know. So I'll bring it back out. We'll look at some of the useful things in it too. You know, if we ever roast something, that doesn't mean we can't get good value out of it as well. So we will see what good value that book has as well. So... That was the majority of the mathematical things I wanted to talk about. I kind of wanted to smash apart this computer even more. <laughs> it's sort of just to uh, frustrate the people who are overly addicted to technology. And even if they know it doesn't work, they feel offended when it gets hurt. But 
I couldn't open the back, and so I think I might try and get some little screws that Apple is gonna make this really hard. They don't want me to like be able to do this. So I'm gonna have to try and get some little like eyeglass screws or something and hope they fit this. Because I wanna see what's inside it. And then when we do other episodes that'll reference computers, maybe we will actually have it completely open. Because the other episode I can imagine making before long that is computer-based would be I kind of want to compile some of the craziest math answers I got from ChatGPT over time into a little episode about AI, but I don't know how soon that one will be coming. Our next couple episodes are mostly number theory. So... That's about all that I had planned. Leave any last thoughts or questions and make sure that after the stream, if you haven't seen yet, that you look at the couple shorts that came out on the Combo Class channel recently and the episode I've been referring to about Balanced Ternary. And the next episode will be coming out, prob I'll say Monday to be safe, but it might come out Saturday or Sunday instead. And there will probably be a bonus video before that as well, too. I have another little short that happens to be sort of a multiplication hack, ironically, from the book that we were discussing. A little hack about multiplying by 11, really easy. I made a short out of that that will be coming out soon, too. And other fun things will be coming as well. I'm going to have a kind of busy weekend, but... You know me. I like to do something on this channel most days, or on one of my channels most days. Of course, make sure you are tuned into the Combo Class channel as well. And let's see. Somebody is recommending something to saw open the laptop. I would have to be very careful if I sawed any metal open. You know, it's... I... I know how to play with certain things safely, like fire and certain tools and things to a safe enough degree. I don't know how to play with saws safely, so we're not. I'll save that for a different expert. Now, somebody's wondering about some learning techniques for writing proofs, and I don't know if I have that thought ready to go right now. I guess a few things to consider are... First of all, just try and write a proof and show it to others and be open to criticism. If you think something makes sense that it works, but other people think there's a gap in it, you got to assume that they're right, that there's some sort of gap and that you thinking it should work may have been thought before and might not be enough. To actually follow through with a proof, you want to make sure each step connects to the last. And you might want to overload it first with extra making sure each step connects and that no axioms were assumed that you didn't make clear are being assumed. Like if you talk about real numbers, if you introduce any new axioms that aren't assumed for the real numbers, mention it. Making sure that you, everything's just building off what axioms your viewer knows you're using and the links from the previous steps and the connections. You might want to overload it and then trim it and make sure that your trimming didn't lose anything crucial. But in general, you know, I would just say to start, study what a lot of proofs look like. There's a lot of neat, simple proofs that can be done in a page for certain things that are quite elegant. And there's also examples of proofs that you can find that took somebody 50 pages to prove something that they genuinely were not able to prove it in any less than that without losing every link being thorough. So maybe I'll do a more, you know, detailed version of that someday. Somebody asked, am I from the future? That's confidential. Now, <laughs> somebody said, use fire then. And fire will come back before long. You know that every couple episodes, sometimes something is on fire. We haven't done that as much recently because I did it a lot toward the end of grade negative one. So I figured in grade negative two, we'll take it a little easier before we start, you know, lighting all the, that stuff. And please do not copy me, anyone. Please do not play with fire. Like... 
<laughs> I'm joking around, but I actually do it safely. Like, you know, fire is actually dangerous. So somebody is, uh, seems to be recommending another book, uh, which is one of some authors, uh, one through Dover books. And that type of publication called Dover Books on Mathematics or something like that has a lot of good books. There's a lot of good books published by that publisher Dover under this Dover in mathematics, whatever header by a lot of different authors. So by the way, if anyone has a request for what you want to see in the next episode, feel free to either comment fire cats or bubbles. And I will consider putting one of those, whichever one you comment in part of the episode I'll be filming tomorrow and the next day. The next two days are for main combo class filming where we're gonna film some cool stuff. Not only will I film whatever episode's coming out this weekend or Monday, but I already started filming a next episode that like I said, it made sense to use a clip of this for some reasons. So you can think about why that would be the case, but it is a math episode more than science. Someone says propane filled bubbles on fire. While I like the thought, you can't vote for two at once yet. Maybe later we'll do a vote where I'll say pick. That actually would be a way more fun vote. Here are like 10 things. Pick two of them you want to see in the intro. Although it already could be that because everyone could vote for one and then I could use the two most picked. But we're in combo class. So that is certainly a combo I've considered. Can I have the bubbles on fire? Answer, someday, yes, not yet. So everyone's coming to fire bubbles. Guys, can't pick two at once yet. We can do fire next to bubbles, but I don't think I can get propane in the bubbles this weekend. I'm a busy guy, can't go propane shopping on a whim. So <laughs> uh, pick fire or, okay, I'll assume that fire next to bubbles will be close enough for now. And no, no uh, neighbors will have any fire problems because we keep it very contained. And we, whenever there's a fire going, my camera person has the hose ready right there. And other safety precautions. Like, you have to be careful. I've lit in fires in the wilderness a lot. I've gone camping a lot. So I actually know the techniques of what sort of, I mean, obviously it's different if you see a clock on fire or if we ever do like a campfire tutorial for real, but I've learned techniques of what types of ground is likely to spread if an ember comes out and what types of ground is the right type of dirt or rock that would not spread if an ember goes out. So there are techniques to keep it safer. So I'm going to assume that bubbles and or fire near each other will be enough. So we'll put some of those in maybe. Like I said, since it's an episode that might be called something like, you know, quick techniques to know any two digit, if any two digit numbers prime or not, then it'll probably be on the shorter end. I've been wanting to try a few more short episodes on the Combo Class channel that have more digestible topics, but I'm gonna get carried away during it. And so every time, like literally like half of the episodes on that channel when I'm filming them, I'm like, this is probably going to be the first episode in a while that's less than 10 minutes. And it very rarely is. I usually have all these other facts I end up wanting to include and then get, you know, it ends up being like 15 or 20 minutes usually. But we'll see. Um, now, and to people commenting about fires on neighbor's property, no, you must respect your neighbors. You got to love your neighbors and all of that, you know. So, me and my neighbors are actually allies. I have neighbors on one side that my cats go in their yard all the time. They take care of crows that flock over that they feed peanuts. And I've house sat for them before. I've fed the crows with them. It's allies. I'll get neighbors on that side. I've chatted with the guy before. He seemed cool. He seemed very receptive to the fact that I stream here a bunch. Allies. So that's what you want. Somebody said they wanted to read 300 books in a week. That sounds sort of impossible to do that and actually get all the data in. Now, I would recommend if you read a math book to take notes while you do it. 
I take a lot of notes while I read. When I see something in a book, I'm like, what other topics does this connect to that I've seen before? What other thing could I try to extend that? So I recommend taking a lot of notes. Even if you don't, I recommend sometimes in a math book, you're gonna have to read a certain paragraph a few times while you're kind of sinking it in in your head. So if you're really sinking in a math book, a whole day of reading, you'd probably read about one book. I don't know, people read at different rates, but when you say 300 books in a week, that's you know a pretty absurd goal. If you read seven books in a week and actually understood them, that would be an insane amount of reading, it would be a book a day. That would maybe be a more realistic goal, if you're gonna go insane. An actually more realistic goal is a book a week or something. Now, somebody's noting math techniques sound like good content for YouTube Shorts. They are probably, because a lot of people on YouTube Shorts like little hacks and stuff like that with numbers and shortcuts and such. I am going to put out more stuff like that that are Shorts that don't always notify the, you guys. I'm going to start, you know, as I have more ability to put out the content I want to put out, I'm going to have content I want you to get notified about on both of my channels multiple times a week. And I might have a lot of other content between that that I don't want to sort of clog up the world with and distract you from the best content. And so some shorts are not going to go to notifications or subscription feeds. Some of them that don't, though, or any of them that don't, I'll make sure to link in streams like this one, where I have linked three that are on the Combo Class channel recently. Somebody said stuff about... Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm going to pause this guy who has a weird name and keeps joking about uh, weird stuff. So remember, people, we want you can make all sorts of silly jokes and stuff, but no need to joke about, you know, disrespecting real people in my world. I like my neighbors. So. Now, somebody said they want to see the crows someday. We can try and get some crow footage. And the crows are really smart. They don't come quite as often, but I have seen them a bunch. And they're big and they're smart. They remind me of one of my cats, Sage. He's like really agile, black, silky, small. And it's like a crow, smart. So... Except the crows and sage don't really like each other. They'll, when he goes in their yard, sometimes they'll like, eh, and like flock around to scare him away. So we'll see the crows. They're really smart. They're cool. Now, somebody is um, noting various books that they think are interesting and different stuff like that. Like I said, I really do hope to start publishing some of my work someday, and I'll keep you posted when that's coming because there's a lot of ways I could do that. I could figure out how to publish, you know, some sort of paper book, which at some point I'm going to want to do for some of them because that's like one of my goals in life is to publish some paper books that are, you know, I'll make them available digitally too. But before that, I might start making some writing available online and such. I might give some sam like early samples to people on my Patreon. But in general, I want my stuff to be available to everyone on the long run. And eventually I'll start putting some written stuff on a website that will <clears throat> be a mix of some wild, interesting things. One of the books that I'm most invested in working in right now, I think a lot of you will like. It's not a textbook. It's a fiction book. But it's somewhat in Choose Your Own Adventure structure not in you changing the plot, but in terms of you picking what order you go to next. And it is heavily mathematical. And it has a bunch of, it's sort of, you have to decode it. It's sort of a puzzle of itself. So I think a lot of you will like that one, among other ones. Among, like I've mentioned, I do think it's one of my jobs in grade negative two slash three slash near future. I think, think one of my jobs in life this decade is to write a book about Threavens and Throds. Because when I thought about that one day, like a year ago, I was like, that just sounds absurd. Just like imagining a book that's just entirely about Threavens and Throds. It's like a whole math book thickness. And then I was like, you know what? What if I actually did it? 
And as I thought about it more, it became less absurdist seeming because I was finding all these facts about Thrivens and Throds that I got to the point where now I'm like, okay, I need to refine my notes and cut some notes. I cannot fit all the notes I have in a book worth about them. So it became a mix of an absurdist goal and a completely practical goal, in my opinion, the book I want to write about Thrivan numbers which will be, you know, maybe more closer to a textbook than a fiction, because some of them will range. In any case, there's a lot of fun videos coming in the near future, too. I am going to log off in a moment. Let's play with the ferro fluid for one last second. Where's my magnets? Here we go. So, time for the last comments, if you want. Uh, and check out the description, you know, in addition to those episodes and shorts and stuff. Of course, there's the Discord. There is a subreddit, and for really helpful combo lords, there is a Patreon. Because, like I said earlier, to anyone assuming that I had like $2,000 to buy a new laptop to break for a scene, really? Is it, I don't think I've ever spent more than... The grandfather clock was by far the most I've ever spent on a clock, and that was 30 or $40. Because it it's used. And every other clock here, I don't think I spent more than $15 on any of these clocks. A lot of them were free. So, you know, if you want me to have newer and crazier clocks and other cool science toys, one option is the Patreon, and one option is the mailbox I have, which I go to once every week or two to see what new stuff some viewers have sent. And that's been fun so far. We've gotten some awesome stuff like this. All right. Now, that's the end of today's bonus stream. Uh, a little later today, I will add some timestamps. So if anybody has parts of the stream they didn't manage to catch, then they can watch whatever portion they want with the timestamps later. And I hope you all have a marvelous day. I'll see you in some bonus content in the nearest future and in another cool combo class episode in a few days, which likely will come out around the time or shortly before my Monday stream, which is the next stream I'll definitely be doing. There's always a chance I'll do one before that, but the next one for sure for the people who like live versions of stuff will be Monday at 5 p.m. Pacific time. So, love you all so much. I'll catch you all in the next one. I'm going to play around with this ferro fluid a little more and get to some more fun editing and note-taking. See you again.